Uh, Sabina is a professional biologist and an environmental educator and a longtime resident of Cortez Island. In the last few years, she's been a volunteer with the Wild Stands Alliance. Sabina, tell us about the piece of music we just listened to. You betcha, Nova. This is a beautiful little piece by Ian Tamblin. It's called North Vancouver Island Song. And uh, Ian is a very good friend um, of mine, of Dennis's. We've traveled extensively with him um, all over the world. Uh, driving zodiacs in the Arctic, the Antarctic. This little piece he wrote when we were traveling uh, northbound through Johnstone Strait to Port Hardy. And Ian has that wonderful knack of being able to be out in those boats all day and then come back on board. And before dinner, the songs are created, and he's captured the essence of the uh, whole day's experience uh, in a song. Hmm. So uh, really enjoy his music. What a delightful one that was to listen to. Thank you. We'll be hearing another two or three of his um, so we've got a, a packed little agenda in terms of what we want to talk about here with Sabina in the next half hour. We're going to end with a, a bit of a, an update about what's happening this weekend. There's a whole bunch of things happening in the forest this weekend. And uh, before that, we're going to speak about the Wild Stands Alliance and what that is and uh, what Sabina and others have been up to over the last couple of years on the ground. But we're going to start out with a little bit of a debrief from a meeting that we had last week with Island Timberlands, just uh, setting the context a little bit for you listeners, perhaps who don't live on Cortez or haven't been plugged in or been away in the sun somewhere. Um, I received a number of letters, like 60, 70, 80 letters uh, be from Cortez residents between Christmas and New Year's asking me to represent you um, to Island Timberlands as an outside agency of issues of concern. And I went down with David Shipway and Andy Ellingson at the end of January, basically just to present those uh, those areas of concern and we got a commitment at that point to a, for a follow-up meeting to really talk a, about operational level issues. So I asked David Shipway and Sabina Leader Mentz to join me uh, for that second meeting because the two of them had, in my judgment, uh, the best understanding on the ground uh, issues as well as mapping, which is really the piece that David is, has held in this community for a couple of decades. And then we joined our, our efforts with the petition, um, Sapora Berman and Carrie Saxifrage, who are both landowners here. Um, and then they brought Geza Vamos, who is a, a forester, a registered professional forester, to help at a technical level. Um, I just want to reiterate again, as I did at the community meeting on Thursday, where I reported out from this meeting, that the petition and the Cortez delegation are two very different things. They have different constituents, um, different messages, but there was enough overlap that we felt it was worth joining efforts on that one meeting. I know that many Cortez residents have signed the petition and many haven't, and the 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 views that I represent on Cortez are much broader than the simple points in the petition, but there was, uh, as I say, enough meat there to, uh, to join efforts in that meeting. So that's just a bit of a context. Um, so Sabina, perhaps just start out with your impressions about the difference in the way that we were received between those um, well, you weren't at the meeting in January, but you met with them in September as a as a guest from the Wild We Stand Society who met with them around purchase options. So what's your difference in understanding between how you were received and the nature of that conversation with them in September and then the one last week? That's right, Nova. I was invited by the Wild We Stand Society to join them on a September 7th meeting. And uh, their goals and objectives there were to continue the dialogue around possible purchase options of uh, a portion or all of the uh, island Timberlands land base on the island. And in general, uh, my impressions from that September 7th meeting were uh, that we were politely dismissed. Uh, we really um, did not, uh, we weren't given validity uh, in, uh, in our requests uh, for purchase at that time. Coming into the meeting uh, last Wednesday, six months later, uh, for me it was really a 180 degree uh, turn in that I feel we were taken very seriously uh, by, Island Til uh, by Island Timberlands. Firstly, their request uh, to receive our local information, our local ecological knowledge, the ground truthing that we've done, uh, information with respect to salmonids when they themselves admitted that they did not have comprehensive information around that. Uh, our information with respect to original growth of trees, um, looking at the cut block maps together and Wayne French realizing that, uh, gosh, um, I didn't see that there um, and I haven't actually been in there in the last couple of years. Maybe we should go in together. And Wayne French? 
Wayne French again, the operations man on the ground for Island Timberlands, who was here and several people met on the 2nd of December um, when he presented the first uh, cut block maps to the community. So I think this idea, again, of being taken seriously uh, for the first time, the professionalism that I feel the Cortez community has brought uh, to the table, has brought to the dialogue with Island Timberlands, uh, has been acknowledged uh, at this point. Cortez is not a radical uh, anti-logging community, uh, as perhaps uh, it was first perceived. It is an ecologically uh, literate community. It's a community where the word ecology is something that all of us really know well. Um, ecology, uh, the root, uh, the Greek root is oikos. It means home. And so many of us uh, on the island understand that this is our home place and how it's all interconnected. So we have a strong sense uh, of ecology. We value our watersheds. We value the quality of the water that we all drink because that's what, uh, next to air, it's really the essence of, of life for us on this island. We value community forests. We value the quality of the lumber and the uh, for our mills and for our woodworkers here and and ecologic, ecological integrity as well as uh, long-term economic uh, stability for the community. That's something I actually really appreciated being able to take down to the meeting was a report from the Community Forest Co-op first annual general meeting that happened here on Cortez the night beforehand. And there was a resolution made from the floor, uh, from the membership at that meeting, uh, directing the newly elected board to, to in their negotiations with Clahous and with the province in um, establishing the new community forest on the, all of the crown land, that they follow in the kind of ecosystem-based forest management approach that the Cortez Ecoforestry Society had developed um, with the professional support of Herb Hammond throughout the, the 1990s, really. Um, and so it felt really professional, if you will, to be able to then speak to Island Timberlands the next day saying that this community is not at all about anti-logging. This is about um, a highly educated community, as you say, who values uh, jobs and, um, and long-term healthy forests that maintain a, a you know, fully functioning forest throughout time and, and throughout space, which is something that Herb has always echoed back to. Uh, I'll, I'll ask at the end of the interview, Sabina, what you think has, has shifted um, that Island Timberlands is receiving us in a more professional manner, but we'll uh, we'll let that digest for a little bit. S um, what were the primary messages that um, that we were taking down to them that we were hearing from the community? I think we had some very strong messages around uh, ecological concerns and, uh, you know, what those concerns might be. We, as an island, again, talking about, you know, Cortez in general and the big picture that we bring into them, um, Cortez has always had a very strong land ethic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Aldo Leopold was really the one who um, defined the land ethic for us, a father of conservation. Aldo Leopold wrote, um, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community and it is wrong when it tends otherwise and so this is this is a very strong uh, message that Cortez is bringing um, to the dialogue with Island Timberlands and that is that when you have uh, in certain situations less than one percent of an intact uh, ecosystem type that's left it's plain wrong to log it there's no rocket science or rocket forestry involved in in that it simply is wrong to do it and these are the things that we're taking to the table. And there are enough people on Cortez who are not willing to be run roughshod over by a $150 billion corporation that they take action. And really, we were bringing to them some of the action, some of the actions and some of the ideas of, of what we are doing as a community. And I think that's act, taking action is really important. It's one of the one of the real rally cries that we have on the island right now is a beautiful quote by Pablo Neruda. In 1955, he wrote, Acción es la madre de la esperanza, which means action is the mother of hope. And so this community is taking multiple 
multiple actions. And one of the most recent actions, I was just in a conference in Victoria a couple of days after our meeting, and uh, the Association of British Columbia Forest Professionals there, um, foresters coming from all over the province of uh, British Columbia, and our Cortez youth, one of the actions that uh, the community, and this is our greater community with our youth in Victoria, that they're taking, is that they'd like to, to take some action. They'd like to have some things change, and so they are championing the Species at Risk Act that the NDP have proposed and is presently tabled at first reading uh, in the legislature. And so two of our youth uh, came to that meeting to request of the forest professionals that were there, uh, how do we make a difference here? We have rare and endangered species living on portions of this land base that is about to be logged uh, now in September of this year, and uh, we want to make a change, and we want to... Uh, we want to see the laws change to affect the values that we hold uh, on the island. And so I would encourage everybody to check into Tidelines and um, see the little piece that's been written there by the Vancouver Observer. And, uh, you know, Farran Reid is, is quoted as saying, you know, I've been in these forests and they're amazing. I just don't understand how they're able to log them. I just want to change things. I'm a Cortesian. <laughs> and I think that's so beautiful. It's so much of what Cortez has been. And this is our youth in this generation, but this is a movement and this is a feeling that has been happening on this island for for a lot of years. And so we actually, and again, this uh, I attended the conference and had the opportunity to gave, gain a little bit larger perspective of what, again, we bring to the IT table. Professionalism and the ability to dialogue with industry. I went to a very interesting talk by Bill Bourgeois from Healthy Communities, Healthy Forests. And Bill was talking about his year-long program last year and the program that he's got set up for 2012, where his whole goal is to try to get communities to the table, to get them educated, enough, educated and responsible enough to be at a table discussing uh, issues like what we're discussing with Island Timberlands. And I was amazed because at the end of his talk, I realized that Cortez Island is already at his end point for 2012. So when I spoke to him afterwards, he was a bit surprised to mm -hmm. hear of the outcome of our meeting on Wednesday with Island Timberlands. And, and he kind of finished off by saying, well, he said, I guess, I guess that's just Cortez. Mm -hmm. And he's very intrigued to work with us now because I asked him, we want to go further than you've envisioned and, and how do we do that? So I think these are the things that we're bringing, um, again, professionalism, when David Shipway can stand up at that meeting and show maps that have been commissioned by the island, talk about forestry and forest mapping that's occurred over the last 20 plus years to give them the big picture of what's going on here. That's what we really brought to the table. And I think for the, one of the first times, perhaps, it was acknowledged and it was recognized. This is a community that is ecologically literate. They are not radicals out on the left side. And we need to listen to them. And they did. And a community that is incredibly well connected uh, beyond our shores and indeed internationally. And, and that was certainly exemplified by the presence of Sapora Berman, who has spent dedicated much of her professional life to negotiating with, with large forest companies around the world. Um, she's since moved on to to work more on the climate change issues, but her, her knowledge at that table it really is a facilitator more than anything was, was invaluable. Sabina, I just want to touch back on the 1% the piece that you mentioned um, and then f f wrap up this first section a little bit with some of the outcomes that came out from that meeting with Alan Timberlands on Wednesday. And then we'll go to another song and then into some of the other um, organizational work. Um, that the 1%, this is relatively new information to me, and I must admit it's caught my attention in, in a relatively substantive way, because we know Cortez as being, you know, our home and, a, you know, a beautiful place. And, uh, but to have outside opinion come and verify the fact that this is truly provincially significant lands um, brought it to another level of of sin sincerity, if you will. And when we went into our meeting with Alan Timberlands, we took some notes from Jody Holmes, who's also a, a, a landowner and resident here. And she worked um, on the Great Bear Rainforest. Um, and sh she shared with us the best available science for the coast, as quoted in the Ecosystem-Based Management Handbook, um, which was a... Uh, a set of information that was developed, funded by government industry and the nonprofit sector, independent science from the Coast Information Team Science Panel, and they said that really, ideally, 
you have 70% of an old growth system intact and that when there is less than 30% of the original old growth left intact in an ecosystem, um, that you're getting to, to ecological critical stage. And here in the, the Salish Sea, the north end of the Salish Sea and the, um, the Douglas fir hemlock um, transition zone, there is far less than that. And whether it's 1% or 3%, you know, depends on the numbers you use, but it is a, a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall integrity of, of the old growth in this system. And um, a lot of that now lies in private land, and there are very few, if any, laws and regulations around private land logging. And, and it, it brings up a real quandary because there's a lot of people on Cortez that hold private land ethic really, really dear. And so how do we then... Um, balance between allowing a company to do what they're legally entitled to do and at the same time trying to protect an ecosystem that is so rare. So what we came out of from that meeting was a commitment from Island Timberlands that they would not come on the island operational in any way, whether it was road building or harvesting activity until at least September. Uh, they committed to doing hand falling rather than large machinery and do the falling over a longer period of time rather than condensed into a few weeks. This is summarized in an article that I just posted today at CortezIsland.com on my, on my page there. Um, but they also committed to a series of follow-ups with us and um, in willing to integrate some information into their GIS data set and then walk with us and meet with us again after we have that information. Perhaps that's just the final piece, Sabina, if you could speak briefly to what are some of those layers of additional information that we want them to be considering in their planning. Yeah, what, we're, what we have um, offered and actually what they have requested is any local information where we found that uh, the information on their maps was lacking. A good example of that was Salmonid presence or, or absence. Uh, in a stream uh, within the forestry regulations that they adhere to, you uh, determine the amount of buffering you give a stream based on whether or not Salmonid species are present. And cutthroat, for example, are a uh, Salmonid species very commonly found uh, in the streams on Cortez. So we noticed inaccuracies in some of their stream work immediately, and uh, they have done. They said we have not done any comprehensive work or studies to see what is actually here, and we would appreciate your local information. We could explain to them that our information has been collected by volunteers, it's scientifically defensible, trained by DFO. So that information will go to them. Information around original growth, 250 years and greater, as well as the 140 year old stands all of those specifics will go to them and this is what they've asked for this is what we will put on the table it's marvelous to have that uh, opportunity so if uh, you out there in radio listener land have anything um, really specifically at an operational level um, that you want to make known please do contact either sabina or david or myself in the next couple of days and, and we can forward that on to island timberlands at which point we'll be walking with them on the ground doing a detailed ground truth and then meeting with them again back in their offices presumably in april they have also committed to doing another community walk. Um, de dates are to be set, but it looks like sometime in March. So there's lots, lots, lots more that could be said there. Um, they did have us leave with the operational detail maps. Those maps um, will be going up, if they're not already up, on bulletin boards in the community. We've got some with us here, just in terms of um, access to good information. That was really my primary request, was access to good information so the community could respond in an educated manner, so we weren't working on, uh, on misunderstandings. Okay, let's hear another song, and then let's go into a little bit about what uh, Wild Stands is and what's coming up this weekend. What have you got up next, Sabina? This is a little piece, uh, again, by in Tamblin, it's called Old Voice, and it's uh, dedicated to Chief Cecil Paul, uh, the chief of the Heisla Nation, who's just recently stated over the uh, Enbridge uh, issue that uh, their um, disagreement with the with the pipeline is not so much uh, civil disobedience, rather it's obedience uh, to all of their relations. Let's have a listen. Color from the mountains Color from the mountains 
down in the water rushes down Boys back on the snow fields tumble down the rock face rush into the sea How I wish I could fly with you But I song. Thank you for that one. This is People's Place in Politics at 89.5 FM, CKTZ uh, FM, Cortez Island Community Radio. I'm your host, Noba Anderson. Um, and just to say that we had scheduled today uh, an interview with the fire department that did not come through at the last minute, so I'm just delighted that I ran to Sabina on the ferry last night, where we were both coming home. And uh, she's going to share a little bit about who Wild Stands is, and uh, then a little bit of what's happening this weekend. And that phone, I'm just going to pick up and uh, hang up, and apologies to whoever that was. You can call back in a few minutes, and I'll take your call when we're off the air. <laughs> Sabina, um, tell me a bit about uh, your involvement with Wild Stands, and who they are. You betcha. The Wild Stands Alliance, uh, really the operative word here is alliance. Um, this is, as Rick Bogner says in his new song, in the new song that uh, he's going to debut on Saturday evening here. <laughs> Trying to turn the As the phone tackles us here. We got her. It's a plug. <laughs> Unplugged it. <laughs> 
So again, Wall Stands Alliance, operative word really there is alliance. And uh, Rick has a beautiful line in his new song where he says, community and unity, creating what we want to see. Uh, that's very much what this alliance is all about. It's an open community process. Anyone and everyone is invited uh, to join in. It really allows and encompasses the multi multifaceted vision of people in the community. So you can be an individual, you can be a couple of people on a working group, a committee, a full-blown society, whatever, all working to a common goal that really defines the alliance. And that common goal is that we want to affect a shift in the paradigm from industrial clear-cut logging by corporate interests to ecosystem-based management, forest management of our local forests by the local community over the long term so that we can affect uh, environmental and economic uh, sustainability. That's what defines the alliance. So it's just the latest expression of the local community, again, saying, I want to see a change, and I'm a Cartesian, and this is the way we're going to do it. And so it's a very, very loose alliance. It's got lots of shoulder room, lots of elbow room, so people don't get you know, on top of each other. What I like to do is um, uh, relate it to a forest. The alliance is literally like a forest. The individual trees are the individuals or the allies that are cooperatively working towards the common goal. And um, a ton of work has been done, and you're telling me that we only have four minutes, and I can't well, really go maybe into maybe six all or that. seven. I'm trying to keep it relatively to an hour here. But let me focus on one of the initiatives there that I've been involved in and I think has been um, very effective, and that is the uh, on the ground. This is um, a group of people. We've uh, run a citizen science program where it started in 2009. We got on the ground. We were ground-truthing the sensitive ecosystem mapping done by the province uh, of British Columbia. And what we wanted to do was um, these maps were made to to be used for a greater informed land use decision making in the province. And so we went out and we took a look at what was on that land base and what was actually there. And when we stand back, just to give people a, a big picture of what's there, is uh, that Cortez is unique. It's ecologically unique uh, in the islands in the Strait of Georgia, and it is provincially significant. So for a lot of people who live here and walk What makes it forth, provincially significant? Well, a lot of different things. <laughs> and I know we often take home for, you know, take it for granted and uh, how could this be special? But it is. Firstly, Cortez Island is at a transitional zone, uh, the northern reaches of the Strait of Georgia. This is where the Douglas fir biogeoclimatic zone that encompasses the uh, lower reaches of the Strait of Georgia transitions into the coastal western hemlock biogeoclimatic zone. We're an edge, and wherever you have edges, you have really increased um, biological diversity. So there's just lots of everything here. Like you'd find at the edge of a stream or a wetland. Exactly. Or a Two zones coming opening. together. Yep. So you've got a little bit of this mm -hmm. biogeoclimatic mm -hmm. zone, a little bit of that one. You put them together, bang, you get a lot of biodiversity. That biodiversity is of ecosystems and of species, and not just any old ecosystems or species species, but here on Cortez, a lot of sensitive ecosystems, as they're defined, and species that are at risk. So plant communities and animals both? Exactly. Uh -huh. And ones that are rare or fragile or have high biodiversity, this is the definition of a sensitive ecosystem. Species at risk are threatened or endangered populations declining dramatically. So is that partly because Cortez just has such a broken landscape with so many wetlands and bluffs? And it, well, is, that, is that unique? It, what is unique about the island is that the whole northern half of Cortez Island is virtually an intact ecosystem base. It's a large area. We have all of this incredible tapestry of sensitive ecosystems which harbor, you know, they are the habitats for the species at risk. And so it's undeveloped. It's a large area. It's intact. That's very unique. You go to Salt Spring, you go to any of the other islands. We have a geographical land base that's large enough to have um, this amount of land in that intact uh, state. What we've got are all these sensitive ecosystems and they're all buffered by the mature forests and we have cross island linkages that literally take the high biodiversity nodes which are these sensitive ecosystems and it links them into all of the others. Everything's intact. Those are wildlife corridors across those linkages and that's why we have we're unique in the straight of Georgia and having these really healthy, large predator-prey relationships, the gray wolf, the, the uh, cougar, the Columbia black-tailed deer. And so 
when you have ecosystems such as this that have uh, high biodiversity, that have very good linkage, these are uh, the places that provide the most resilience and adaptability to climate change. And again, one of the reasons that Cortez is unique uh, within it. So when Bill Waugh said at our meeting last week that he would commit to protecting old growth trees that were older than 250 years old, unless it was a safety hazard to his workers, obviously, um, why is that not sufficient from an ecological perspective to, to retain trees? It's not sufficient from an ecological standpoint because when those old trees start to fall, where are the 140-year-old trees that are going to replace them? Hmm. Where are the recruitment forests? And those recruitment forests are in the 140-year-old trees. Right. And that's not something that he said Alan Timberlands was interested in doing. Exactly. And that's something that, 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 we, are interested, yeah, right. that we are interested in. So another in one of our, our gaps. One of our challenges there. Okay, so what's happening this weekend? You've got a forest fest, something or other? We do. Which is, it's, it's all spontaneous, and, and uh, Bertha is very politely waiting, <laughs> patiently waiting for the <laughs> announcement to go into the marketer. But um, with the uh, good news of the, um, the Wednesday meeting with Island Timberlands, with the acknowledgement of what the community uh, would like to do, uh, we have decided that whew, it's a lot, uh, a lot more fun to be singing and dancing this weekend with Rick Bachner and friends uh, and enjoying some movies uh, to celebrate great rainforests and taking community walks uh, than it would be to have been on the front line of a blockade. So a bit of a spontaneous Forest Fest weekend. We've got, uh, you know, spontaneous celebration of all of this successful community forest dialogue. Um, I'm offering forest walks. Um, several of us will be taking people out Friday morning, Saturday morning, Sunday, starting at 10 o'clock. Uh, and you'll see this on the tidelines and in the flyer, posters around the community. We'll be taking people into the Children's Forest on Friday. This is the region around Carrington that's being targeted for purchase. Uh, Saturday morning going into the Basil Creek watershed for folks who really want to understand what old growth is and, and where is what Basil? like basil creek is squirrel cove um okay. section 29 and so, so just, uh, just across this, the road up a little bit from the from torque road exactly okay. when you're going up from torque road towards the gorge it's the um top yellow gate on the south side and that will be our meeting point saturday morning at 10 o'clock uh, for the children's forest we'll be meeting at uh just off the whale town road where you head into the mccoy's gravel pit okay. on that road on sunday morning we'll head into um delight lake watershed some people know it as Green Valley, uh, Blue Jay, and that uh, is marked as uh, Green Valley Trailhead on the Squirrel Cove Road, about halfway between uh, Squirrel Cove and the Gorge. So, so that's those are Sunday. all 10 o'clock in the morning. 10 o'clock in the Friday, morning. Friday, Saturday, yep. Sunday morning. Really, You'll be out for two, three hours. Exactly. Really okay. encouraging people to come out, people who have questions about what the heck is all this talk about uh, that's been going on, what are the significance of these forests. A lot of people who go, heck, we don't have old growth. Well, I really invite people to come out and to understand a little bit more about what defines old growth and how the government, the, uh, the standards are defined and what we're looking and the citizen work that the community has um, done on the ground. And I can't underline that enough to, to get educated. And if your belief and opinion is at the end that um, the proposed logging activity is entirely acceptable or that it is absolutely unacceptable or anywhere in that spectrum, absolutely fair game, so be it. That is, that is your personal right. Um, and there is diversity in this community, and we celebrate that diversity just as we do at an ecological level. Exactly. Um, but the more information that you can have to make that opinion, the better. So if you haven't had a chance, I mean, I've only been out in the forest with Sabina wee little bits, but uh, the, the amount that one learns is, is stunning. My brain gets full pretty quick. Another great event that's uh, just happened in the last couple of days has been confirmed is we um, are very pleased to be able to welcome Richard Boyce, he is an award-winning filmmaker, uh, a movie called Rainforest, The Limit of Splendor. Walked away with the Best Mountain Culture Award at the Whistler Film Festival recently and has been highly praised um, by the jury there. It's inspired by um, Quaxistala, who is a uh, Quaquac Aqua clan chief. And he really, what Richard Boyce does is he contrasts tree farms that dominate uh, Vancouver Island with the actual ancient rainforests on the Pacific coast. And he contrasts the modern industrial logging methods with the forestry that's been practiced by the First Nations for the past 10,000 years. So where is so that? Richard's coming in uh, for the weekend. He will be screening rainforest at uh, the Tiber Bay Room at Linnea. And he'll be showing that film Friday evening at 7.30 p.m. 
and then we're doing a special matinee, same place, on Saturday at 3 p.m. And if people aren't able to make it, or our, our listeners that aren't on island, is there any way that people can view this in another way? Well, what Richard has done is he's just coming out of White Rock. He has been touring the province uh, with this um, little video. His website is www.rain forestmovie.ca and there you can find the actual uh, schedule for the various cities where the uh, movie is being shown and we're just lucky because he made a special, she's making a special trip and squeezing us in be between this, uh, the tour that he has rainforestmovie.ca exactly, okay. and then of course the, the benefit we thought this rainforest movie would be a fantastic uh, way to set the context for Rick Bachner and Friends uh, forest benefit on Saturday evening, so pulling it all together Together. That's at Manson's oh, Hall. At Manson's? Yeah. Okay. Rick is here at Manson's Hall. What a weekend. <laughs> Holy. Go to sleep, people. <laughs> so we were thinking green and thinking forest, but actually there's a snow warning out, so the forest may be white this weekend. But Oh, that can be absolutely gorgeous and a rare treat exactly. out here on the, on the West Coast. All right, well, we've got a little bit over time, but as I say at the end of every single show I've done so far, we could spend another hour really easily uh, talking about all these things. Um, Sabina, thank you so much for coming in and, uh, and jamming a whack load of information into, into half an hour.